All right. Our next speaker is going to be Ellie Abrams from UC Berkeley. Um, she's going to be talking to us about parallelizing cloud computing. So this is a way to speed up all of your computing and to process things a lot faster if you want to scale to a continent size sort of analysis. This is the way that you do it. I'll turn it over to you. Thanks, Tasha. Thanks for having me here. So uh, we had a bunch of excellent tutorials so far today. I've learned a tremendous amount and I'm excited to talk to you about DAS, which has actually kind of been present a little bit throughout the day until now, but we're going to take a more explicit look at DASC. But before we do that, just so we can better monitor the memory that we are using when we look at DASC, I'm actually going to ask anyone who has been working through previous tutorials to shut down those kernels, and I'll show you how to do that right here. So I'm in that really fantastic slide rule tutorial that we just had, and if I head up to kernel there, I can hit shut down kernel. And so any tutorials that you have open, uh, please shut down those kernels. And we'll head over now in that same tutorial section to DASC for geoscientists. And we'll just keep that kernel activated so we can monitor the memory that we're using in this particular. Yeah. Oh, this, oh yes, thank you, yeah. So thank you, Tasha. Yeah, if you go ahead over to here, actually you can see all of your open kernels. Uh, if it's easiest for you, you can hit shut down all and then reopen to ask for geoscientists or shut them down one by one. Thank you. Yeah, I forgot about that shortcut, but that's an excellent shortcut. And so uh, who in this room is familiar with DASC or has used DASC explicitly before? Awesome, excellent. Who here has used parallel computing? Wonderful. And when you've used parallel computing, have you specifically written out your HPC code so you know kind of which pieces of code you're sending through which threads? Cool. Awesome. Okay. So we're going to start a very gentle start kind of into parallel computing and talk about how we might be using these things. So throughout the day, and Tasha just mentioned, uh, we sometimes want to do continent scale analysis. And this really requires us to bring in data that is too large for the memory of our machines. So if we pause for a second and ask ourselves, because here we are on the cloud and we've been hearing that the cloud has tremendous compute power, that we can access machines with CPUs and GPUs that have terabytes of data storage. What does that mean for us when we're on CryoCloud CryoCloud right now in a particular instance and trying to work with it. So at the beginning of the day, when Tasha showed us how to open up CryoCloud, and I'm using this word instance, that means the piece of CryoCloud that you're using on your computer right now, we call that your instance of CryoCloud. So when you've opened that, you actually limited the amount of physical space you have, in the case of CryoCloud, on Amazon servers, located in a particular location, and you have access, if you opened up that 16 gigabyte instance, you have access to four processors that between them have shared 16 gigabytes of data. And if you ever wanna just check, if you're curious, how do I check how many processors do I have? In CryoCloud, you can just open a new tab and hit terminal, and you can check, there's multiple ways to check this. Um, I had that up here, of course. Now I'm trying to remember what it is. I think it's all, yeah, there we go. So you can just use the nproc command. You can see, like I mentioned before, you've got access to four processors. If you open up a bigger instance, the 32 gigabyte instance, you might have access to more, but this is how you know kind of how much different physical spaces you have access to at, with this open instance to store your data. So how do you take huge data when you're trying to bring it in and thread it through all these different processors? And so Dask is a Python code base that allows you to do this, and it's specifically created for big data. And so the two main components of Dask are these big data collections, these ways of interacting with various Python libraries we might be more familiar with, 
things like pandas data frames or numpy or x-ray arrays but we even can use various dask functions called bags to work with iterators so that we can work with giant pieces of data but when we have these giant pieces of data that sometimes we have to store on these multiple processors, we need some way to thread them together. We need some kind of scheduler. And so Dask does a specific kind of scheduling that's called dynamic task scheduling. So it, sp it splits things between these four different processors and actually has ways to thread uh, maybe a computational analysis that you want to do on all of these different processors at the same time. And so what does this mean? This is really a lot of words, but Dask has some really great visualizations up on their documentation. And, and this is one of the visualizations kind of in the Dask intro, where we can see over here on the left, we've got various data collections. If you're working with images, which is what we'll be exploring today, this might be Dask arrays. So anyone here who's used NumPy arrays or X arrays, Dask arrays are how we interact with those. Maybe just like in the previous tutorial where Scott uh, showed you how you might have a data frame with billions of rows, you might want to use a Dask data frame if you are accessing something with billions of rows. But there's also things for more complicated computing that you might be using if you're writing some complex iterators or using some more complex file systems to interact with Dask. So let's say now you have this image, you have it split up, it's a huge image, it's split up across your four processors. And you just wanna do something like take an average and then only withhold part of that image where your average is above a certain threshold. So there you've actually created yourself a thread of computations. You want to average your image, you want to hold those averages, and then you wanna know which pixels are above the threshold. So Dask creates a um, symbolic task graph. So before running these things, which can take a lot of memory and be run across all of these processors, Dask actually, actually allows you to create this thread of tasks. So you can kind of build up all of those computations that you need, and it will hold that list of computations that you need for you and wait until you're ready, until you've put together kind of all of those data reduction processes through those computations and run them whenever you decide that you've built up your computation thread in something called a scheduler. And Dask can schedule this on a single machine. So if you wanna use Dask on your local machine, maybe you have one CPU that you've split into four different threads and that's how you wanna do it for efficiency. Or perhaps like we are, you're on a, on a cloud or maybe you're accessing a cluster at your university and you have some kind of distributed set of machines or you've got four CPUs that are dedicated to you and maybe they're not actually right next to each other, but Dask can still treat them like a single system. And so that's kind of the power of Dask's big data collections combined with the, the dynamic scheduling that allows you to run analysis on these big things. And so here, there, there's many different reasons why Dask is really powerful. Uh, today, we're really going to focus mostly on something called lazy evaluation. So how Dask does this efficiently is it actually maintains a lot of symbolic access to your data. And we'll explore what this means a little further in just a minute. But rather than pulling all of your data from wherever it's stored in a bucket on the cloud immediately into your instance and flooding your instance, Dask actually allows you to think about what computational thread do you want to build up? How do you really want to interact with this data before it pulls it all down to your machine? And so you could use smaller machines. You can use a machine that's, let's say, 16 gigabyte to actually interact with data on the cloud that might be hundreds of gigabytes. And so this allows you, instead of having to open a really expensive instance on the cloud, the, the cost of instances really scales up with how much memory you're asking Amazon to hold for you. So if you are gonna ask Amazon to hold a terabyte of memory for you, that really scales up kind of the cost of what you need, but it could be ultimately, even if you have to access an image that inside the bucket is a terabyte, maybe you only need a handful of gigabytes. And so Dask allows you not to have to persist all of that in memory. It allows you actually to do some data side computation so that you don't have to do it on your own instance and machine. So uh, Dask does have many different kinds of, uh, of these um, 
data collections that we can interact with. Today, we're focusing on data images. And so we're going to think about data arrays. And so for anyone here who's ever used X-Array to interact with images before or NumPy to interact with images before, we're going to explore how we do this from a desk perspective. And so we'll start. Um, actually, I will say for anyone that wants to follow along at the beginning of this um, notebook right here, I recommend installing this graph viz because there's some nice desk visualizations we're going to access with it. But we'll also step through all of these computations right here. So first, we'll take a look at what a NumPy array looks like and how a Dask array is different than an NumPy array. So Dask array is really just, they've been using this word data collection, a collection of many NumPy arrays, or perhaps a collection of many X arrays, whatever array system you're using within Python. So we'll just import NumPy here, and we'll take a look, we'll create a NumPy array, uh, a somewhat large NumPy array of a bunch of NumPy ones. And this exists somewhere here, in this memory that is part of your CryoCloud instance. Let's take a look at the size of what this is. So we've created here uh, a, a NumPy array that is 30 megabytes. So physically somewhere in Amazon, this NumPy array exists, and that's how much space it's taking up. It's not a very big array, but we're going to use it as an example to walk through in Dask, and then later we'll actually use Dask on some very large data uh, from Landsat that we hope to ask access. So can we create the same array in Dask? How would we make just an array of ones? So you'll notice we're importing here Dask array, and we're doing the same thing. We're just creating an array of ones with the same shape as above, but instead now we get a visualization. So we'll notice that NumPy printed out this array, and we don't see any printed array here when we take a look at it, but we have this nice kind of symbolic visualization of what's going on. What's also interesting, if you pay attention down here to the memory, you'll see that there's not much of an increase. Before, we have 30 megabytes that are now dedicated to our uh, NumPy array. We've also got most of these megabytes that are just running this notebook. And we have barely any data that's being held for the Dask array. And that's because the Dask array is not filled with data at this point. Da the Dask array that we have created is purely symbolic. So it's just saying that somewhere at some point, we will be filling an array, an array of ones of this particular shape. So kind of like a heads up to your system that at some point we will be populating this data. But right now we're just holding in our symbolic knowledge that this data is coming down the pipeline. And you'll notice also that there's this uh, line here that says Dask graphs, one chunk, one, well, I guess it says chunks because usually we don't end up with a single chunk, but one chunk in one layer. And that's because we are working right now with a very small sized object, about 30 megabytes. But you can imagine that if you're bringing something in that let's say is 50 gigabytes, you could not store that on one of your processors. You'd actually have to split it up across your processors. And so Dask uses something that Dask calls chunks to dynamically assign kind of physical memory space to pieces of whatever data that you're hoping to bring into your machine. And these chunks are really important. Chunks are kind of one of the keystones of Dask and really the power of Dask. And we could spend all day on a tutorial just about chunks. And so this tutorial here is a really kind of gentle introduction to Dask. But next, Johnny Kingslake is going to be up and do a deeper dive into kind of the power of chunks when you're working with some really large image data sets. So here we'll quickly kind of go through how you might specify your own chunk. So let's say you know you have an array, you know you're going to need it to be split. We'll do a natural split. We know we have four processors here, so we're going to split our data just into four different chunks. Our, our visualization there kind of updates divided by four, but we haven't really done anything very specific with that. And it could be that if you have really large data, you want to very specifically chunk it in space. Maybe you want to very specifically chunk it in time. And so there are ways to mindfully chunk. And this requires kind of some upfront thinking, a lot of experimentation to see what's working well uh, in terms of how your analyses are going to run through. And um, Johnny really has some beautiful visualizations coming up to think about chunking. So here we are. We've got our symbolic array. It's still empty. It's in four chunks. Now we want to fill it. And so this 
kind of holding our array in symbolic space is what Dask calls lazy evaluation or lazy load. We haven't loaded anything yet. We haven't, if we were pulling data from somewhere, we haven't pulled any data yet, but we're just saying to our computational space, this data will exist. At some point, we will put it here and we need a container for it. So Dask has this symbolic container. But if we do want Dask to fill it, then we can call this Dask function called compute right here, which we'll do. And we compute it and you'll see it looks just like the NumPy array. And that really is because now it's a NumPy array. We have completed our um, symbolic thread of computation. Here, all that was was placing data inside an array. And now we're back to a, a, a Python object that we're used to interacting with on a regular basis. In this case, a NumPy array. But let's think about how did Dask do this? We had these four processors. We uh, had the symbolic Dask array fit into four different chunks. What was Dask doing behind the scenes? And so Dask has this really nifty visualized function that allows you to look at what happened in the background when we ran that compute. So right here, we'll run Dask visualize. Ah, I see that I did not install Graphviz. So um, we'll skip what that looks like right here, but uh, all was that was showing you was that kind of those four different chunks and that a NumPy array of ones was being called for each one of those chunks and being placed into those four chunks. And I'm only skipping Graphviz right here because it does take a few minutes to install it and actually put it within uh, the um, Python path that we need to be able to be access to this notebook, but it's okay because I, I still have the output. So we'll take a look at what that means for a more complex calculation. So you see here, let's say we actually really wanna interact with our data. We didn't only want to populate it, but we wanted to do something. So perhaps we wanted to do a bit of some complex math with it, uh, to do some slicing while we were doing that, and also take the mean of our data. So we can visualize that, uh, um, we can visualize that calculation path that Dask took in the symbolic array to kind of reduce our data down to going through this calculation we're interested in doing on it and taking the mean of that calculation. So you'll notice we'll start out just with these ones like array. Dask is putting these NumPy array of ones into each one of the four processors. And then it's going through and deciding kind of dynamically how it's going to get each one of those items, how it's going to do those layers of multiplication, how it's going to take the means across every chunk, how then that is going to aggregate all of those means into the single mean on your data. So you've got combined partial means. And finally you have your entire mean. So behind the scenes, uh, yes, Tasha. Um, I was just going to let you know it's much faster. Oh, sweet. Awesome. Okay. Excellent. Let's do that here so we could run that. Okay. But okay. Yeah. So when Mamba is installed in CryoCloud, Mamba is really, really lightning fast for a lot of Conda installs. So definitely keep that in mind. Uh, for for when you're interacting with this notebook later. Um, so we can see that Dask is really capable of, of holding this compu complicated dynamic task list. And as we move through this tutorial, we're going to dive into kind of a, even a deeper dive, how we might use this to interact with data we need for our cryospheric tasks. But for now, even just on this array of NumPy ones, we can see how Dask is dynamically scheduling what happens. You can see even in this dynamic schedule, sometimes the order of things gets swapped and Dask will do this on the fly. There are also ways to explicitly uh, indicate how you want Dask to do this. If you know you have a complicated set of equations that needs to happen in a particular order that Dask might not be familiar with because we're gonna see how we can specify custom equations for Dask. You can also uh, specify kind of the order of that, this dynamic task scheduling here. And so uh, we were right now interacting with an array that ultimately was only 30 megabytes, but in just a little bit, we're going to actually work with some much larger data. And so you wanna monitor how Dask is interacting with the memory of your system. And so you can do this by using something called the Dask dashboard, which uh, Tasha actually 
uh, showed us right at the beginning. So if you want to see your own DASC dashboard, just go here to the left of your screen and hit, it's the only icon that has some color on it there, the DASC icon. And you can see right now that our dashboard's not connected. So we haven't connected the dashboard to this notebook, and we're going to do that right now using uh, some DASC functionality from DASC Distributed. So we create a client first uh, for this notebook, and then we just take a look inside the client that we've created, and we can copy right here from this line that says dashboard, this path right here. So, uh, oh, it's gonna copy the cell. Oh, launch dashboard in JupyterLab. There's a beautiful button right there that I was not familiar with. So you can just hit this button and it will launch your dashboard. You'll notice that there's a lot of different metrics that you can take a look at and monitor. Uh, today, we're just going to look right now at task stream progress. Workers memory and graph. And right now, since we just initialized our client, this DASC dashboard has no previous knowledge of what we had been doing in DASC. If we had launched it before that comparison between NumPy and DASC arrays, we would already see some of this, some of these uh, metrics populated, kind of monitoring how our instance interacted uh, with the four different processors there. But right now, if we take a look, we just see that we've got four different workers. Those are for our four different processors that we have access to. And we're going to see an empty graph. The scheduler is empty because it has no knowledge of what we've done previously in DASC. The task stream is also going to be empty. And progress as well will be empty because we're about to kind of embark on a new DASC journey. And we're going to see how we can uh, monitor what's going on with DASC as we use it. So uh, we're going to kind of turn the tutorial in a second to take a look at this for some images for Landsat. But I just want to pause at this moment and ask if anyone has any questions so far. OK, awesome. And feel free also to jump in if you do find that as we go through this, we have questions. So uh, who here works with satellite imagery? Nice, awesome. Who here has ever needed an image that was larger than the memory that you had available? Yeah, yeah, this is a problem that we run into where maybe we need an image, perhaps it's stored on the cloud, perhaps it's stored at a server at somewhere like NSIDC, and the image that we need to interact with, even if the data that we ultimately need is small enough to fit on our machine, the overall image is too big. And so today we're going to learn how to use Dask with cloud data to interact with images that are too big for our CryoCloud instance. So that if we wanted to access this image, we actually wouldn't even be able to use CryoCloud to access it because server side, it's just too big for what we need. But the data that we're interested in is actually small enough to be used on our CryoCloud instances. In fact, ultimately the data we need is small enough to be used on the smallest CryoCloud instance. So how, how do we use Dask to do this? So for folks following along, we're going to use some tools that have specifically been built to make it easier to interact with PyStack data using Dask. Those tools are StackStack, and we're going to use, just as another example of another way to access data in the cloud, uh, a Python package called Planetary Computer. And so uh, these packages are not yet default on CryoCloud. They will be default on CryoCloud, but we're just going to use that same pip install that we've used in some previous tutorials to install both of these packages. So you can run them here, uh, and then you have Planetary Computer and StackStack installed. And in addition to these, we're using some tools that you might have encountered before, like Restereo and PyProject to project onto... Um, uh, different projections of the Earth, so we can actually see how we can use this to interact with our data data side, even while it's not yet on our local instance. And so we bring in these imports, and now we're going to use that combination of planetary computer and stack stack to access Landsat. And so this function that I'm running right here accesses Landsat kind of through through a planetary computer. Uh, 
point, but it's actually accessing Landsat on AWS. So it's going to go pretty quickly for us, which is nice. Uh, we define an area of interest because we're all sitting here in the Moscone Center. I thought it could be fun for us to take a look at San Francisco, uh, where we are. But you could really define any polygon of interest to yourself that you're, you're planning on looking at. Uh, and now we're going to just search that catalog for the Landsat collection to pull in this polygon that we defined. And so we can see oftentimes when we're interacting with satellite imagery, there are various things that we actually want to threshold our data on. We're only interested in data that meets some kinds of quality standards. So here we're going to see a query side limitation. So maybe we're only interested in images that have uh, cloud cover that is less than 20% because we're not really studying clouds. We want to know what's happening on the ground. And so query side, we can just use the standard uh, cloud cover tag within Landsat limit our images to those less than 20%, but maybe we haven't quite decided yet what else we want to do. So we'll run that query, uh, which will go back through, uh, through Microsoft and AWS to find that there are 183 images that fit our search criteria. I will take a look at how these images are stored. Right now, they're just a PyStack item collection. And so, what that means when it's a PySec item collection and why this is running so quickly is we haven't fully pulled that data down to our computer. If we take a look back right here, we can see we're still on the order of just a couple hundred of megabytes. So we don't have that full 183 images on our CryoCloud instance. And this is good because right now we only have 16 gigabytes of space. And so if we'd pull down that full cryo, that full Landsat image, let's actually see how much space that would take. So what we're gonna do is as we did for that uh, previous NumPy array, we're actually gonna define a symbolic Dask enabled X array that would be the ultimate size of uh, kind of of this image of San Francisco that we we're trying to access in Landsat. So let's take a look at how big that would be. So you can see here that this image, we expect it to be 630 gigabytes. So this is a very large image. We've actually pulled down five different bands and um, we, oh, we haven't pulled it down yet, but we've, we've selected an image with five different bands that is nearly 10,000 by 10,000 pixels. So this is a huge image server side. In, in the bucket, this is taking up way more gigabytes than we have access to. And to to get those access to all of those gigabytes on the cloud would be expensive and really would re require kind of scaling up how we're using the cloud. But maybe we don't want this entire image. Maybe we're this is these are the images that we need to access, but we're just trying to understand something about it. Perhaps we're trying to segment the image. Perhaps we want a threshold. So how can we use Dask to actually step through and do some of those computations server side so that we don't have to use up 630 gigabytes on our own machine? So uh, let's do that here. And uh, I see that right here, Dask is telling you kind of the size that this image is expected to be. But if you also wanted to look at that explicitly, you could just take a look kind of at the expected bytes uh, and print out uh, how big it would be. So again, a, a really large, almost 700 gigabyte image there. So too large for our CryoCloud instance. So let's start refining our data. And because we have pulled this data down into symbolic X-ray, we can actually create a thread of X-ray computations. So anyone who's familiar with X-ray might know how we can index into various different bands. So perhaps we just want to look at the RGB images. So we could use X-ray to index uh, only those red, green, blue bands. Maybe we don't need every image. Maybe we just need a, a kind of monthly median to understand what's happening in the time series, especially because as Landsat passes over San Francisco, we don't expect it to get the same uh, view on the CCD every time. And so if we look at every image, we're going to end up with NANs in some of those images. And so taking a monthly median might give us a better understanding of what's happening kind of across the entire area of interest. So we could just use X-Array here, some, some default in X-Array to take that monthly median. And maybe actually, as we think about it, we queried an image initially that was too big and we wanna make it smaller. 
but first we want to project it. We working in latitude, longitude, it's not working for us. So we want to project it to UTM coordinates so we can actually define some, some kind of kilometer space that we're interested in. Maybe we're just interested in the six kilometer zone that is the city of San Francisco rather than the entire Bay Area. So we can also uh, use, in this case, we're using a Python package called PyProj to project into a different uh, coordinate system and also just create a zone of interest. We'll create this area of interest that's six kilometers big. And you'll notice how quickly each one of these cells is running. And these cells are running so quickly because we're still working in that symbolic space. So we're still building up this thread within Dask. We haven't actually run compute in Dask yet. So we're not working with real data yet. We're working with kind of the symbolic container of this data and we're symbolically thresholding and symbolically taking smaller and smaller pieces of this data. And so now finally, we know the data that we're interested in right here. We can see it's much smaller. <laughs> so we went from an image that was 670 gigabytes to something that is 44 megabytes. So this definitely now fits on our CryoCloud machines, but it's not here yet. It's still in symbolic space. But just by using Dask enabled X-ray, we're able to create kind of this thresholding uh, computational thread that allows us to actually get our data of interest. And our data of interest is now a size that we can easily work with on our CryoCloud instance. So how do we now actually make our data arrive? So we've created this symbolic thread. We want to bring it in. So we can use that same compute function that we used before right here. And you'll notice that you're not seeing anything. But if we head over now to those uh, Dask diagnostics that we were looking before, we can actually see how Dask is splitting the, this data import into a bunch of different tasks and how it's only bringing in tiny pieces of that import at a time. So we can see in red what memory is being used, what memory has been used before and is being released to make room for more pieces of the image to be brought in. So even though we're initially working with a 670 gigabyte image, Dask is enabling us to work within the limitations of the memory that's available. And so various diagnostics, if you're interested in seeing how is Dask doing it, what are the background tasks, you can monitor the task stream here and kind of uh, hover over it and see what the different names of the tasks are. Maybe you're just interested in the progress. You want this to happen already. How quickly is it happening? So you could take a look at those various things. And over on the left here, you'll notice there's also many more diagnostics you can look at. These four, I think, are, are nice diagnostics to begin with because they give you this really nice... Um, overall view in the graph view, a nice progress view. You can familiarize yourself with the way Dask thinks about tasks and uses those tasks. And also an important thing to monitor is your memory. You can monitor how much memory is being used just to ensure that you are not crashing your system. Uh, as Tasha mentioned earlier, if you overload your memory, like if you try to exceed that 16 gigabytes that you selected, you will just crash your kernel and you'll have to start again. So it's always a good idea to monitor that memory. And so we're just going to wait here for a second, but you will notice an interesting thing here is that we're getting a runtime warning that some of those slices, so some of those monthly medians are actually all NANs. They're entirely filled with NANs. And uh, has anyone in X-Ray before removed NANs? So I see some nodding. Yeah, yeah, awesome. Yeah, so X-Ray has some default functions for removing NANs. So it's a natural question to ask me like, hey, Ellie, you said you're building up this really nice thread of DAS computations. Why didn't you just remove the NANDs? Like get rid of those NANDs and then you could run your DAS compute. So this is a great question. And this is where unfortunately, like the more you use DAS, the more you'll be able to know ahead of time where this is gonna happen. When DAS removes NANDs, it pulls all your data in memory to remove those NANDs and then it deletes that. So you actually, when you run Dask Compute, will be doubling your compute time by running the X-Array remove NAN function. And so you're gonna wanna do that afterwards, which as we're just waiting for this to compute here, is exactly what we're gonna do next. Once our data is now actually stored in our X-Array, uh, which is gonna happen pretty soon, we'll go through and remove the NANs, not not server side, but actually on our own instance, because there was no point in doubling up on that computation. Um, 
I will say, and this is something that I I do like being able to see the diagnostics, but keeping the diagnostics open tends to double your compute time because it's also now calculating all these things for the diagnostics and making the visualizations. So it definitely takes a little bit more time. If you don't want that time, if you're bringing in a really large image, you can just skip loading your desk dashboard and this, uh, this cell right here will run much, much faster. So like we mentioned that we do, we wanted to do, we'll drop all our NANDs, but now this data is actually instant side. This data is present in our instance and we can immediately see that. We see that we've jumped up from megabytes right now to something on the order of gigabytes. And that when we take a look at our data, it's no longer desk enabled. We no longer see that symbolic visualization. Instead, we just see an X-ray data array. And so we can visualize this data here, which we'll do, and this is just using one of X-ray's native uh, plotting functions to run through it. And we'll take a look. We can see we're looking at San Francisco. We've got monthly medians where they're available, which is really nice. So we've got this beautiful time series that we've built up from a giant image that we were able to run on a relatively small machine pretty efficiently. And that's all thanks to the way that StackStack is using Dask under the hood with X-Array. Do we have any questions at this point? Awesome. And if you find as we go through that you do have a question, feel free to raise your hand, save it. Like you can save it for the end. You can say in real time, everything works for right here. Uh, yeah, Johnny. Oh, that's a really good question. That's a really good question. It could be. Well, so the thing is when... Mm, mm. Yes. Yeah. So, so, and you can separate your dashboard from your cluster. So Johnny's asking a question about something called a cluster, which is how behind the hood. Oh, should I repeat? I should repeat the question. Okay. So Johnny was asking that since this dashboard is making our computation take longer, could we just close the dashboard and reopen it? And then another question, if we did open something called a Dask cluster, would that make our data our computation take longer and should we be closing the Dask cluster? So uh, Johnny's actually going to show us in the next tutorial what a Dask cluster is. By using Stack Stack, I'm using something under the hood called a Dask cluster, which is that dynamic scheduler. It's how Dask decides which processor to send each one of those tasks in this graph to. So uh, that graph that had kind of all of those different tasks running, um, is decided where in our cluster for processors to send through this thing called the, the Dask cluster. And so typically we'd actually want to initialize the Dask cluster and Johnny's going to show you how to do that. But this tool that we're using Stack Stack actually initialized one for us under the hood. So we wouldn't want to close our Dask cluster, but then a separate question, would we want to close the Dask dashboard? So we could close the Dask dashboard and it would make this computation run faster, but it, then, then the dashboard would have no knowledge of these computations. So if we tried to reopen it afterwards, we wouldn't be able to see what happened. So you'll notice that, um, oh, it's interesting. It refreshed itself. Oh, it's still there. You'll notice how the task stream is kind of still held, even though my compute has already completed, that I can see the previous task stream. So if I wanted to be monitoring that for some reason, if I had tasks I needed to happen in a particular order, so I wanted to be able to tr visually track the stream, or perhaps I still wanted some knowledge of my progress, and typically this is also still held. At, I'm not sure why it's not jumping up in here. Um, and I see the scheduler is empty, but this is also usually still held until you close your dashboard. Um, it actually kind of lets you go back and see how are the tasks split. So if for some reason it was really important to you to know that, and it can be when you're working with more complex data, it's always a trade-off if you decide to run through longer computation, like have a longer computation, but have kind of have that visual knowledge, or if it's better just to have a more efficient computation and, and not know it. But it's, it, that's a really great question, but I, I think it would make it faster, but I, it really depends on, on kind of which of that knowledge that you need. Um, okay. Yeah. Sweet. So we're going to now, uh, 
think about how we might actually run some more complex Pythons. So uh, some complex Python functions. So at this point, what we did is we used some default functions in X-Ray. We took, we took an average, we uh, limited to certain bands, but maybe we're interested in band ratios and those are not default functions in X-Ray. Or perhaps we're actually interested in something that requires multiplication and division and subtraction. So uh, there is a particular function called the normalized difference vegetation index, which I don't think in the cryosphere we interact with so much, but because we're looking at San Francisco, maybe we wanna see where are there trees in San Francisco? Where is there a lot of vegetation? So we can uh, take a look again, define our area of interest. And in, the, in this case, we're actually uh, going back and keeping all the bands because for this NDVI, we need our infrared bands back. And we create this function that has a uh, subtraction held in memory and addition held in memory. And we also uh, take the fraction between those two. So we've got quite a few things going on here. But we don't need the NDVI for every image. We're just curious, kind of on average, how much vegetation is around San Francisco. So we want the entire mean. So you have a choice like above, you could create a separate cell where you define that mean computation, but you could also do it in real time. Just all you need to do then is either add a dot compute at the end, or in this case, uh, I'm showing you another example of how you might actually run your computation, which is a dot persist. And they have some subtle differences between the both of them. And we'll do that here. Uh, and again, because now we're, we're running through uh, this computation, we can pop back over to our graph and see how this computation has been split up into a bunch of different tasks. We can see uh, kind of how it's going through in, in different pieces of our memory and running through different chunks of this. Um, and you might ask me, this is really interesting, but why not just run a dot visualize? Because I think Johnny had a really good question. Like sometimes we need to know things from this dashboard, but we also need our computation to be efficient. So you ran a dot visualize above on that uh, small desk array. Why not run the dot visualize function here? And this is where I'll caution you. You can, it will take so long. <laughs> it really, really takes a long time. There's just something about dot visualize and I'm not familiar enough with what's happening with Dask under the hood, but when you're working with Dask arrays and it's slightly different when you're working with data frames or bags and you run dot visualize on a really complex, you'll see how complex this task list is here. If you look at it, you see it's really splitting off into smaller and smaller tasks that dot visualize tends to get stuck on that a little bit. So that's why we couldn't just run that here. So that was pretty quick. We started from our data completely being server side. We created this complex custom function and we ran it and boom, we already have now just the data we needed. All we needed was that NDVI result averaged across the entire year. So we can run that right here and immediately we see wherever there's blue, there's a lot of trees. We can pick out the parks in San Francisco pretty easily but also certain areas seem to have a lot of streets that do have a lot of trees on them, which is pretty nice. But this is a great way to calculate band ratios. Perhaps we wanna do some machine learning. Perhaps we're actually interested in running some more complex functionality. So both scikit-image and scikit-learn actually have Dask integrated functionality. And we'll take a look at that here. But I do notice I'm slightly over time. I can also leave this kind of for further learning for people to step through if that's better. I would say about five minutes. Okay, so let's take a look at a kind of lower level scikit image machine learning problem, but you can scale this up to actually interact with things like random forest or XGBoost as well. And so let's take all of, all of our uh, different bands and reduce them down to a single band that's just a band of interest. So here again, we're writing a custom mathematical equation for Dask, and it's just an alternative way to make this happen. We're calculating something called luminance, which allows us to combine the red, green, and blue band to see bright objects. And uh, we'll run this function that we wrote on our area of interest. Just like before, we haven't run our computation thread yet. We're just building up our Dask computation thread. And we'll take the average luminance because we're interested in this, not in each timestamp, but just across the entire year. And we'll take a look 
If you ever want to check whether or not you are still in this Dask symbolic space, you could just look at your variable. You see here that you still are in a, a Dask uh, enabled X array right here. And finally, what we'll do is we'll actually look at the image of this. So whenever you run imshow, and I just wanted to show this here, because you need to have that image in your local instance, even though I didn't run compute, I'm still bringing in all that data. And so imshow is going to take a little while as it steps through this computational thread that I did here, this, this luminance calculation that I made and taking the luminance specifically on this area of interest and uh, this area of interest, and then taking the average of that, uh, of kind of that uh, reduced band across the entire year. And so we'll just wait a few seconds while imshow goes through, like it, it's not really imshow going through those calculations, it's Dask going through those calculations and then passing it into matplotlib so that we can see that image. And if you want to see that Dask is running under the hood here, you can see uh, kind of how this is being distributed in memory. Um, and you can also see the moment that it's kind of finished because now everything is released. Yes. I have what? Yes, I do. Yes. Yeah, this is a great question. Yeah, so right now I'm working with Cloud Optimized GeoTIFFs, which makes it very easy to interact with X-Array. But it could be if you have an HDF5, maybe you still want to work with X-Array, but it might look slightly different. Or it could be you're using a different set of array functions. And so one of the really nice things about Dask is it's actually optimized to be work, like it was built to work with different types of data storages. And so there's a lot of uh, native functionality with NumPy, with X-Array, with Pandas, and also various other, other um, data types. I know that people have written a bunch of things to work with Dask and uh, JSON as well. So I, I wouldn't be surprised if there's GeoJSON functionality in some of the, the Dask capabilities as well. Yeah, yeah. Oh, this is a great question. Yeah, yeah. No, and I'm really happy both of you brought this up because this is excellent. Right now, I'm bringing everything from the cloud, and Dask is a really powerful tool for bringing things that uh, inside their S3 bucket are too large. But what happens server side? So you have this HDF HDF5 file. It's not on the cloud, and it's big. So that will be taking up the memory it takes up. You can't get around this. But one case you really might run into an issue with this is if you need to use GPUs. And one of the reasons you'll run into an issue with this is that typically we have way more space on our CPUs than our GPUs. Most GPU chips only have onboard memory of on order 15, 16 gigabytes. So if you have a 50 gigabyte image and you want to be able to read it in from your CPU, so this image is on your hard drive, it's in your RAM, on your CPU, but you want to be able to read it into your GPU, you can actually use Dask as well for local streaming. To, so to stream chunks of that image on your CPU into the GPU to do the analysis on the GPU, and then also now hold the post-analyzed um, data now in CPU memory to kind of stream through those more complex GPU calculations that you want to do. So that might be an instance where you are doing this on a local machine where you have the CPU power to hold this large HDF5 HDF file or other file. Um, okay, excellent. Yeah, so we, we can see now we have our luminance and quickly we'll just run a, a quick scikit image function on this. And so uh, right here, we're gonna apply something called a Gaussian filter, which will allow us to do a simple segmentation. If we run this through, uh, we wanna apply a custom function to X-Array. This is actually an X-Array function, but you'll notice that I have allowed Dask on here. So I've told X-Array that I want it to be working with Dask in order to enable this large function that's too big to happen on my uh, on my instance itself. And then once I do that, I can just apply a simple threshold and actually pull out 
some segmented buildings from San Francisco. So this is not a complicated segmenter. This is not using um, a PyTorch or TensorFlow in any kind of deep learning way, but it's just a simple, uh, simple Gaussian filter that we've used to segment out some of the buildings. And uh, so this is just an example of some of the ways that we can use Dask, starting with very large images on the cloud and use it to, in the end, only hold the space on our computer for the final analysis that we're interested in. Looking back down at our memory, we're still under two gigabytes. So even though we now have on our computer segmented buildings that we took from an image that was 670 gigabytes, all we need to hold on our computer is less than two gigabytes, thanks to Dask. 